Welcome everyone. This is lecture 21 of this series of lectures. These lectures accompany my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common and Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. Please subscribe to the channel and like the videos. This is the book and you can find more information in the description. It's available on Amazon as a paperback and as an ebook. Let's get started. We are still in chapter two, hypokalemia, and this is part seven, treatment of hypokalemia. Patients with serum potassium in the range of three to 3.5 milligrams per liter are usually treated with oral potassium salts, unless they cannot take oral medications. Now, if potassium is below 3, then we may need to replace potassium intravenously. If we have rhabdomyolysis arrhythmias, then we have to replace intravenously. Many times we do both. We replace intravenously while we are starting oral potassium salt. Now, intravenous replacement of potassium also is appropriate for patients with EKG changes or if we have diabetic ketoacidosis, because unless we are ahead of that, we are going to end up with hypokalemia because of intravenous insulin. So according to protocol, once you are doing the initial resuscitation, subsequent resuscitation is going to have fluids with potassium. Now, some say that for every one milliequivalent per liter drop in serum potassium, we have a total deficit of 200 to 400 milliequivalents because most of the potassium is intracellular. But this is not very accurate, and we cannot rely on that. So we are going to replace potassium, and we are going to check potassium every two to four hours, and then regroup. Then we decide what to do next. Most patients are treated with potassium chloride. Rarely we use a different salt. Why? It is widely available. You can find it in extended release tablets, capsules, liquid, IV, and it works quickly. Uh, in case of metabolic alkalosis, you have to use potassium chloride because of the chloride portion. We are going to talk about chloride-sensitive metabolic alkalosis, and unless you provide chloride with the potassium, you are not going to get rid of the metabolic alkalosis. Another thing, chloride stays extracellularly. So when you're giving potassium bicarbonate, the bicarbonate is going to enter the cell, then potassium, which is positive, is going to follow the negative bicarb, and this is going to make potassium bicarbonate less effective. Potassium citrate, potassium acetate is the same thing because citrate and acetate are metabolized by the liver to bicarbonate. Now, this is a table, and really you have to pay the most attention to potassium chloride. It's available in different forms. It's the preferred treatment, especially in metabolic alkalosis. It gives us the most amount of potassium, but you cannot crush the extended release tablets. Potassium bicarbonate may be appropriate for patients with renal tubular acidosis or diarrhea because you are replacing bicarb. It's effervescent, so some patients find it more acceptable. But if you have metabolic alkalosis, you're going to make it worse. And again, it's less effective. Potassium citrate is only used for patients with renal tubular acidosis. Sometimes when we want to replace citrate in potassium with kidney stones, in patients with kidney stones, even if they don't have hypokalemia, if they have hypocitraturia, and in case of diarrhea. But it's not used often. It is very expensive as well. Potassium acetate is only used in TPN, okay? So it's not oral. Potassium phosphate, whether oral or PO, is used to replace phosphorus. So it's mostly a phosphate replacement. But if you have both, then you might as well uh, use it. Potassium gluconate is available over the counter. It's not recommended. I, I don't like the idea of patients managing their own potassium with over-the-counter uh, medications. Intravenous potassium chloride, the rate should not exceed 10 milliequivalents per hour. 20 milliequivalents per hour is possible if you have like a true emergency, and I don't remember the last time I used that, so it's rarely needed. But if you have arrhythmias, maybe you can give uh, 20 mole equivalents an hour for the first hour and then drop to 10 mole equivalents. The patient must be on telemetry. 
Now, uh, it's preferable to give it through a central catheter because it burns, it can cause phlebitis. And uh, when we're giving potassium chloride, we like to give it in normal saline and not with dextrose because dextrose is going to stimulate the secretion, the release of insulin, and then insulin is going to drive potassium intracellularly, and this is going to aggravate the hypokalemia. So usually we give th those K riders 20 ml equivalents of KCL in 100 ml of 0.9 uh, sodium chloride, and we give it over two hours. What about dietary sources of potassium? Well, salt substitutes are a good source of oral potassium. Each gram contains 13.6 mole equivalent, so this is a nice number to, uh, to keep in mind. Now, of course, the, the other way around, potassium chloride salts are horrible for hyperkalemia and a source for causing hyperkalemia, so let's keep that also in mind. Now, potassium-containing foods are appropriate for chronic management of mild hypokalemia. We're not going to uh, give the patient tomatoes and bananas if they are having uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Um, so uh, bananas, for example, are a good source of potassium. How much? Well, there's one mill equivalent per centimeter. So uh, you need three large bananas to get 40 mil equivalents of potassium. So this is going to give the patient a lot of calories and uh, uh, dextrose and fructose, so it, it may not be desirable. Um, other potassium-containing foods include dried fruits, so dates, figs, prunes, spinach, broccoli, kiwis, mangoes, oranges, tomatoes, avocados, bananas. Milk is a good source of potassium, believe it or not. Raisins, uh, lima beans. Now, all these things also keep in mind if you are counseling a patient about low potassium diet. These are the things to avoid if they are having hyperkalemia. What about potassium sparing diuretics? Well, they are appropriate for the management of hypokalemia, especially if the patient is taking a diuretic already, like a thiazide or a loop diuretic. Sometimes it's very hard to keep up with hypokalemia, and potassium pills are large, they're hard to swallow, patients hate them, so sometimes it makes a lot of sense to give a potassium sparing diuretic alongside a thiazide or a loop diuretic. So aldosterone receptor antagonists like spironolactone or ipilirinone may help in the management, especially in patients with advanced congestive heart failure and in patients with resistant hypertension. Amyloride is a good choice. It's well tolerated. It blocks the epithelial sodium channel, but it's not appropriate if we uh, have a patient post-MI or uh, with advanced CHF because it's, it's never been studied in that regard. So we, we will stick with the spironolactone or plurinone. Triamterine is rarely used nowadays. It can cause kidney stones, um, and we, we prefer other potassium-sparing potassium uh, diuretics. Now, what about finurinone? This is uh, the new non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. It is available under the name of Corindia. You may not have heard of it, but you will hear a lot about it. It has high selectivity towards the mineralocorticoid receptor, similar to spironolactone, but low affinity towards androgen, glucocorticoid, and progesterone receptors like eplurinone. It is indicated, it is approved for chronic kidney disease associated with type 2 diabetes mellitus. And uh, it uh, reduces the uh, progression towards renal failure. It helps with the reducing hospitalizations. So if, especially if you're an internist, a nephrologist, an endocrinologist, please familiarize yourself with the Fidelio CKD trial published in 2020 in the New England Journal of Medicine. You'll find the reference on the screen. Um, it seems that finurinone causes less hyperkalemia than spironolactone. Uh, so stay tuned, but this is an important agent. Now, uh, some final remarks. Laxatives and diuretics should be stopped if they are causing hyperkalemia. We should treat vomiting and diarrhea symptomatically. If the patient needs both bicarbonate and potassium intravenously, first give potassium and then bicarbonate because bicarbonate would drive potassium intracellularly and that would worsen hypokalemia. Final remarks and key points. Hypokalemia is common in inpatients and outpatients. The main potassium regulating hormone is aldosterone. 
potassium should be treated orally, but in case of emergencies or severe hypokalemia, potassium less than 3 will be treated intravenously. Potassium is Potassium chloride is the preferred and the most commonly used potassium salt. And usually we diagnose hypokalemia with a careful history, checking blood pressure, a few laboratory tests. And the main uh, task is to distinguish renal loss from GI loss. If you are suspecting uh, an aldosterone secreting tumor, primary aldosteronism, you should consult a specialist, a nephrologist, or an endocrinologist. Well, we have some time. Let's do a case. Uh, hypokalemia with arrhythmia. Case number one, 50-year-old man with CHF presents with weakness and palpitations. He's on furosemide, digoxin, carvidolol, quinipril, and atorvastatin. EKG showed proxismal atrial tachycardia with 2 to 1 block. Potassium is very low, 2.9. Digoxin level is high, 3.1. How would you manage him? This is the EKG. As you can see, we have paroxysmal atrial tachycardia with 2 to 1 block. So the diagnosis is digoxin toxicity associated with hypokalemia and cause, causing arrhythmia. You put the patient on telemetry. You give the patient intravenous potassium chloride while you are starting oral potassium chloride. Obviously, you hold digoxin and see if it can be discontinued hopefully permanently. Let's do another quick case. Case number two, hypokalemia and congestive heart failure. Here we have a 76-year-old woman with CHF, EF 20%. She's on furosemide, bisoprolol, which is a beta blocker, and enalapril. On a routine lab, potassium is 3.4. Blood pressure a little bit high, 144 over 93. How would you approach the management? Looking here, we have CHF, which is what? Chronic and systolic. Number two, hypokalemia. Number three, high blood pressure. How do we approach? Well, this is chronic mild hypokalemia. We want to reduce blood pressure. Well, spironolactone here is very appropriate. Why? It's going to help blood pressure. It is indicated for chronic systolic severe CHF, and it will help potassium. So you kill not one, not two, but three birds in a stone. In the RALS study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1999, aldosterone reduced morbidity and mortality in patients with severe heart failure. However, you should always monitor for hyperkalemia. You cannot start spironolactone and let the patient go. You need to check potassium maybe in a week, in a month, and then every two to three months if things are stable. Well, I'm going to end here, and we are going to do more cases uh, in the next lecture. Thank you.